My name is Susan Durham. I am the Division Chief of Pediatric Neurosurgery at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. I'll be talking about head shapes in infants. When is it really craniosynostosis? The three objectives from this lecture are first to identify the most common types of craniosynostosis in children, two, to understand the surgical procedures used for correction of the most common types of craniosynostosis, and three, to differentiate between positional plagiocephaly and craniosynostosis. Craniosynostosis is premature ossification and obliteration of the skull sutures, and the sutures involved determine the resultant head shape of the child. The epidemiology shows us that the incidence in simple non-syndromic craniosynostosis is one in 2,000 births. In syndromic synostosis, it's approximately one in 25,000 births. Sagittal synostosis is the most common type within 40 to 60% of cases. Coronal synostosis, both bicoronal and unilateral coronal, make up about a quarter of the cases. Metopic synostosis accounts for about 10% of all cases, with lambdoidal synostosis being the most rare at about 5%. Occasionally, children will have two or more cranial sutures that are fused, again, about four to eight percent of all cases. The cranial sutures are well-defined on the skull. The metopic suture runs between the two frontal bones and is the only cranial suture that you don't see in adults, but only see in children, particularly in infants. There are two coronal sutures, a sagittal suture running down the midline of the skull, and paired lambdoidal sutures in the posterior portion of the skull. Here are some fun facts about skull growth. Bone growth is driven by the expanding growth of the brain. A small head typically means that a child has a smaller sized brain. Head size. The, brain, the head is actually 35% of the adult size when a child is born. By the time a child is seven, the head is actually 90% of the size it's gonna be as an adult. The metopic suture, the suture that runs between the two frontal bones, is the only suture that completely closes over with bone, and this bony fusion is usually complete by age two. Sutures do not fuse after complete growth of the head. There's always fibrous tissue intervening. In craniosynostosis, bony fusion of the suture occurs. Virchow's law tells us that cranial growth occurs parallel to the fused suture. This is a picture of a child with a fused sagittal suture. You can see that the head is long and narrow. There is decreased growth, which is perpendicular to the fused suture. And there's exaggerated growth that's parallel to the fused suture. The diagnosis of craniosynostosis is typically a clinical diagnosis. Infants are born with a characteristic skull shape that is typically present at birth and becomes exaggerated over time. Radiographic studies include plain skull x-rays, which are typically of little value. A CT head with 3D reconstruction will accurately demonstrate which cranial sutures are fused. Ultrasound is an emerging technology that can actually help uh, diagnose fusion of the involved sutures. The treatment of craniosynostosis, there's typically two rationales for treatment. The first is one of aesthetics. And this is the most common indication in single suture craniosynostosis because the cranial deformity worsens with head growth. This often, often has involved facial involvement with facial asymmetry and also has a significant psychological impact to the child and the family. The functional rationale for treatment are much more common in syndromic children. These children may often have increased intracranial pressure, papilledema and decreased visual acuity. They often have hydrocephalus, as well as risks for corneal exposure. Surgical timing for repair of craniosynostosis really depends on when the child is diagnosed. We like to take advantage of the exponential growth phase of the skull, which occurs in the first 18 months of life. Normally, a child's head grows approximately two centimeters per month for the first six months of life and one centimeter a month for six to 12 months of life. Early diagnosis is key in determining what type of surgery should be done. 
When children are diagnosed before three months of age, they can often be a candidate for the endoscopic assisted procedures. At this point, the skull is thin and malleable, and there's little need for extensive bone work. These children are typically placed in a cranial molding helmet postoperatively for a period of six to 12 months. Unfortunately, most children are diagnosed after three months of age, making them not the best candidates for endoscopic approaches. I'd like to review the different types of craniosynostosis. Sagittal synostosis is fusion of the sagittal suture, which runs along the midline of the skull. This is the most common type of craniosynostosis and occurs most commonly in males compared to females at a four to one ratio. This is often described as scaphocephaly or dolicocephaly, which comes from the Greek word scaph, meaning boat. It is characterized by a boat-like cranium. Sagittal synostosis typically have an exaggerated anterior-posterior elongation of the skull, a high forehead, as well as both frontal and occipital bossing. In sagittal synostosis, you typically see an absent sagittal suture, you see an increased AP length of the skull, and you see a narrow bitemporal distance. And this picture demonstrates a 3D reconstruction of a, CT, of a CT scan of a child, which demonstrates sagittal synostosis and complete fusion of the sagittal suture. The treatment for sagittal synostosis varies by the time of diagnosis. If a child is diagnosed early, typically before three to four months of age, they're a candidate for an endoscopic suturectomy followed by a molding helmet therapy. At age four to six months, children typically go what's, undergo what's called an open calvarial remodeling. And this is a surgery that's performed to reduce the AP dimension of the skull, and we barrel stave the temporal areas, allowing for bitemporal widening. At late diagnosis, which is approximately one to two years of life, these children can be candidates for cranial distraction. Whereas a very late diagnosis, after two years of age, this requires a much more complex calvarial vault remodeling with frontal orbital advancements, a complete calvarial vault remodeling and bone grafting, which is a much larger surgery to do. This is an example of an endoscopic repair, which is typically done prior to three months of age. It's a simple suturectomy of the sagittal suture. The width of the suture that's removed is approximately three to five centimeters, and there's an option for adding barrel stave osteotomies bilaterally. The advantage of this approach is that it's less blood loss in a young infant. There's a shorter operative time, as well as anesthesia time, and a shorter length of stay. The drawbacks to this um, procedure at this age are there's limited visibility for what we're doing, and also requires helmet compliance post-operatively between six to 12 months of helmet therapy afterwards. The picture on the right demonstrates the incisions that are made on the cranium. There's two small incisions that are made which allow us access to the fused suture underneath. And the second picture is that of a typical cranial molding helmet orthosis that is uh, worn by the children post-operatively. The typical calvarial remodeling, which is typically performed at three to six months of age, has been described in a variety of methods. Um, depending on the shape of the skull and the frontal versus occipital bossing versus the degree of bitemporal narrowing, there are many different options for calvarial vault remodeling for treatment of sagittal synostosis that have been described over the years. Here's a typical picture of a pre and post operative head shape uh, in sagittal synostosis. The pictures on the left are a top down view and a side view of a child with sagittal synostosis. And you can see that the head is very narrow and very long. And the pictures on the right are about two weeks post operatively from a calvarial vault remodeling. And you can see that the head is shorter and wider and much more round than when they started. Um, when they before, prior to the having their surgery. The second type of, crani of cranial synostosis that's commonly seen is coronal synostosis. And this is seen anywhere between 20 to 30% of all cases. And this is a fusion of one or both of the coronal sutures. 
This type is more common in females. Unilateral coronal synostosis is seen about twice as commonly as bilateral synostosis. Unilateral is typically isolated. Bilateral coronal synostosis is often syndromic. The picture on the right is a picture of a fused coronal suture, and it demonstrates the compensatory cranial remodeling as a, revol as a result of the uh, coronal suture being fused with contralateral forehead bossing and ipsilateral forehead flattening. Unilateral coronal synostosis, again, shows ipsilateral forehead flattening as well as contralateral forehead bossing. The ipsilateral eye is more open. The ipsilateral brow is higher. These children often have a C-shaped facial deformity and the base of the nose and the chin typically point away from the affected side. Unilateral coronal synostosis can be treated endoscopically, again, before three months of age, requiring these children to wear a helmet postoperatively for anywhere between six and 12 months. The picture on the top on the right demonstrates the bony cuts that are made for repair of coronal synostosis unilaterally. Traditionally, these are treated with a, tradition, with a bilateral frontal orbital advancement, and this is done between six and nine months of age. And in this type of surgery, the entire frontal bone as well as the frontal orbital bar are removed and remodeled to uh, alleviate the flattening and the hypoplasia on the affected side. The third type of craniosynostosis is metopic synostosis, and this is fusion of the metopic suture. This is the only suture to fuse normally in the first year of life. This head shape is typically called trigonencephaly, which is named after Greek trigonon, meaning triangle. And you can see that the head shape is characterized by a keel-shaped triangular forehead. The pictures on the right are a, C a 3D CT scan of a child with uh, metopic synostosis. And you can appreciate the triangle shape of the forehead and the, how the eyes are close together. This is called hypotelarism. These children often have bitemporal narrowing, hypotelarism, and a midline ridge along the forehead. The treatment of metopic synostosis varies depending on the severity of the synostosis and head shape deformity. Typically, these are mild. They do not have any bitemporal narrowing and may only have a small palpable ridge on the forehead. In these cases, it's these are, children are typically treated with reassurance to the parents and, and followed and told that this is a normal skull variant. In moderate craniosynostosis of the metopic suture without significant temporal narrowing or hypotelarism, these children can often be a candidate for a less, lesser involved surgery called an endoscopic metopic strip craniectomy. Again, this would need to be done within the first three months of life. In children that have severe bitemporal narrowing and cranial deformities, these children typically undergo a frontal orbital reconstruction as well as an anterior cranial vault remodeling, where again, the frontal bone is removed as well as the orbital bandeau or frontal orbital bar. And both of these are reshaped to reduce the triangular shape of the forehead. Here is a pre and post operative picture of a child with metopic synostosis. In the preoperative picture, you can really appreciate the triangular shape to the forehead. And the postoperative picture shows nice bitemporal widening and a more normal shaped head. Lambdoidal synostosis is probably the most rare, occurring in anywhere between 1 to 5 percent of children. There is typically flattening of the occiput, and the ipsilateral ear is deviated inferiorly. There is a pronounced contralateral parietal bulge, and these children are are often confused with positional plagiocephaly, and it's important to be able to differentiate lambdoidal synostosis from positional plagiocephaly. Positional plagiocephaly, often called a flat head, is probably the most common referral to a pediatric neurosurgeon or a pediatric craniofacial surgeon. This comes from the Greek word plagios, meaning oblique, and cephaly, meaning head. And this is an asymmetric cranial and facial deformity.
Positional plagiocephaly typically is caused by back sleeping, where a child prefers to sleep on one side of the head rather than the other. Torticollis, where the head uh, does not rotate normally, often causes positional plagiocephaly, as does prolonged stays in the neonatal intensive care units where children are often nursed on their backs, as well as limited mobility in children with developmental delays that don't develop the ability to roll and sit up proper, sit up at the uh, usual times. The treatment for positional plagiocephaly is typically conservative. Counter positioning, which means teaching the parents methods to not have the child always laying on the affected side, as well as physical therapy, which may help with torticollis and allowing the child to move the neck more freely to avoid sleeping on the affected side. And in severe cases, sometimes a molding helmet is used, which is an external orthosis, which will actually works to reshape the head um, over a period of about three to six months. Molding helmets are typically most effective when used in the first year of life. Differentiation between positional plagiocephaly and lambdoidal synostosis is important. This is a schematic of a vertex view or a top-down view looking at the difference in head shapes between positional plagiocephaly and lambdoidal synostosis. Both of these illustrate flattening in the right occiput. With positional plagiocephaly, when you look down at the child's head, everything on the right side is deviated anteriorly. So the right ear will be moved forward as well as the right forehead and sometimes the right cheekbone. In lambdoidal synostosis, it's the opposite. Even though the right side might be flat, the right ear is actually deviated inferiorly and posteriorly, and the contralateral forehead is pushed forward. And there's typically a, a strong compensatory contralateral parietal bulge, which again can be confused with positional plagiocephaly. This is another schematic demonstrating the difference between positional molding and lambdoid synostosis, which again demonstrates the position of the ear and the position of the frontal protuberance, which is quite different between the two. A posterior view of the head is often very helpful in differentiating between positional plagiocephaly and lambdoidal synostosis. In positional plagiocephaly, the ears are level. In lambdoidal synostosis, the involved ear is deviated inferiorly, and there's often a very large protuberance of the mastoid and the skull base on the affected side, as well as a strong contralateral bulge in the parietal region on the contralateral side. And you can see that the head shape looks very different when viewed from behind in posterior, in um, lambdoidal synostosis versus positional plagiocephaly. So in conclusion, head shape abnormalities are a very common pediatric diagnosis. Most can be diagnosed by clinical history and exam alone. Radiographic imaging, the 3D CT, which is the diagnostic test of choice, should only be done when the diagnosis is in question or if there's other clinical suspicion that one would need to image the uh, brain. There's very limited role for skull x-rays in this diagnosis. Early diagnosis and treatment is important. There's less resultant skull base and facial asymmetries, which are often difficult to correct even after the child has had surgery. And this really requires a multidisciplinary team approach, both by pediatric neurosurgeons, as well as pediatric plastic surgeons and craniofacial surgeons. Thank you.